Hello, viewer. Venture Link here. Hey, how are you? Good day. Good evening. That being said, today's video is going to give you guys a walkthrough on how to run a new power lead into your Saturn S series. In addition, I'm going to show you guys how to preventiv preventatively kick a problem known as the F5 in the butt. Um, just so you know, this little thing happens on connector F6 on Gen 1. And connector A2, I believe, on Gen 3. The patient in question is a 1997 SL2. Because of that, this is a Gen 2 vehicle. Now, for those of you who don't that don't know what I'm talking about, the F5 and all those other connectors are a connector that's on your underhood junction block on the back side where the wires are. This connector is constant hot for everything that's on your IP bat fuse. Including, but not limited to, the three main culprits are the fuel pump, the constant power, but it is controlled off of a relay, the constant power for the radio, and the power adapter. What ends up killing this connector is constant loads such as high-powered aftermarket radios, constantly charging your cell phone or GPS or whatever, and because the F5 is like a low-grade wire, like 16 gauge or something, and the fuel pump draws 8 to 10 amps by default anyway. Eventually, this wire will heat up, melt, and cause all kinds of running problems. Just so you know, when I say, you know, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, it's based on interior. Gen 1 is 91 through 94. Gen 2 is 95 through 99. Gen 3 is 2000 to 2002. And... This is not a video on how to fix the F5 issue, but if you do have a problem with the F5 where it did melt and you had to fix it, I will link you to a thread on the Saturn Fans forums for more information on how to fix it. Anyways, let's get to work. Um, first thing you want to do is pop this upper dash dashboard here. Now, just so you know, there is a rich pin video on how to do this. It's within his instrument cluster R and R video, but because it's a little quiet, I'm gonna give you guys a too long didn't watch version of it. There are two access clips. Um, you may not be able to. There we go. There's one here, one here. You take a flathead screwdriver, pop these little panels out. There should be a seven millimeter screw in each hole. Remove them. Once you remove them, you want to put a panel remover or a flathead screwdriver carefully within this dash crease. As there are several clips that hold the dash trim to this dashboard. Just say no, and just as a fair warning, these little dash clips are, you know, like brass or whatever, held on by plastic, so do be careful. And just say so you know, other pieces that you will be re removing today would be this upper dash uh, or this upper door trim here um there should be two lower door trims in the back and two upholstery trims each have the same clip set up so so to avoid repeating myself like four or five times i figured i'll go over this fair warning once and get it over with and after you remove the dashboard by the way there should be a piece of foam that you have to remove Remove that, and you have your dash trim out of the way. <coughs> okay, as I said, next step is to remove this upper door trim. It goes up here, intersects right here, and goes all the way in the back. You should be able to just pop that off with your bare hand. Just as a fair warning, do not try to pop it off with your screwdriver or flathead, or flathead screwdriver or panel remover. Lest you get all these fun little holes in your headliner. These were most likely the end result of when I did my seatbelt R&R project. So, yeah, just as a fair warning, don't try to do it. Just pop it out with your bare hands. Next thing you want to do is remove this sun visor here. There should be three Phillips head screws that hold it in. In addition, there's a Phillips head screw that holds this little locking bracket in place. What I would do personally to ensure easy access, easy installation later on is put a mock, like say right here or right here or wherever you choose with a Sharpie. 
So that way it will align properly and go onto your bracket just fine after after you after you put, or before you put it back on. Now, next thing you want to do is remove this handle. Normally, there would be a plastic piece that guards this screw, but it keeps coming off. But you should take a flathead screwdriver, pop this piece off, pop this piece off. Same 7 millimeter screw as that what was in the dashboard. Remove both the screws and you will have, should have easier access to the headliner. Just so you know, when you do pop this, this upper door trim off here, as you can see, there's my power line. Goes right into the trunk. You have direct trunk access. Just so you know, I used a number 10 wire to help, a, a, to help take into consideration the attenuation and all that. What I did was I took a combination of stuffing the wire into this upper door trim and possibly some of the headliner. That's why you had to remove all that stuff to get there because it made it easier to maneuver the headliner. Just as a fair warning, when you, if you have to attempt other projects that involve taking down this door trim, such as seat belts, headliner, sunroof, whatever else, the learning curve will now be somewhat extended because now you got to restuff that line back into this door trim or into your headliner, however you choose to run your wire. Next thing you want to do is remove this lower door trim here. Remove this upholstery piece over here. Just so you know, there is a there is the same piece on the right side as well. Take down these seats. And you should have, and that's just so you know, there should be some Christmas tree push pins. Normally there would be one here, but I guess it fell out. But just say so you know, there's a push pin here, a push pin over here, and there's another one. Again, there should be another one right there, but I guess that one fell out. Remove these, and you should have removed these. Compress your uh, package tray in the center, pull out, and you'll have access to your package tray. Just so you know, I had you remove the package tray because there are plenty of good grounds. Should you need to tap a ground, I would personally tap it within the package tray. Now here's how to actually run the power line into your vehicle. Um, just so you know, this is the main wiring grommet for the vehicle. As you can see, this gray conduit down here goes from this grommet all the way into your main underhood junction block. And because of that, there are important wires that are in this run, such as PCM wires, injector wires, ignition module wires, etc. So what I would do is I would carefully pull back on this grommet, take a blunt-tipped Phillips head screwdriver, carefully carve in a hole until you get one big enough to fit your wires through, and then run it into the vehicle. Just as a fair warning again, do not use box cutters, knives, etc. Because you do not want to nick any of these wires. Because you will get running problems or other intermittent electrical problems because you nick the wires or you cut them. So only use a blunt tipped Phillips screwdriver and you'll be fine. Uh, just so you know, when you do run the wire through, normally it would. If you run it in long enough, it will end up somewhere down here on this floorboard. What I did to get it up into the door trim was I took a piece of shoestring, ran it down long enough to where it would hit this floor, tie it to one of my wires, and then I ran it up, pet, lifted past the computer, and up the door trim and in the trunk. Um, just so you know, because the F5 does involve kicking the Casa radio power and the power adapter in the butt what I did is this blue wire was for my relay project which I will go over in a couple minutes I ran this wire back behind the the steering knuckle here and behind the accelerator just as a fair warning you may want to test drive this configuration a few times 
just to be sure that you do not nick the wires in any way to prevent short circuits. And then after that, you should have easy access under your radio trim. Woohoo! One thing I want to show off real quick is my trunk-based power adapter. And just so you know, after you do, of course, get your wires ran into the truck of your vehicle, from this point, unless you're going to run more wires back here, you should be able to pretty much reassemble everything that you took off earlier. You know, the dash trim, the sun visor and bracket, upper door trim, lower door trim in the back, upholstery piece, etc. So I would go on ahead and reassemble everything now. Uh, just so you know, before we get to the radio installation and, on, and how to wire it up, <coughs> sorry, I actually found an alternative method of access to get power into your trunk. Um, of course, you will still need to remove this upper upholstery trim here and this lower dash trim here, but see this trim here? After you get the, the wire from the under the dash and onto the floor, you could actually run it where this where the trim piece was. Then run it underneath where the seat belt is. Run it where this is. Stuff it in here, and you're in the trunk. Now, as you can see, this this has all these plastic clips on here, so. Because of that, the fair warning from earlier about the plastic clips does apply. Okay, this is the old-ish radio installation. Uh, just so you know, the red wire is accessories. Yellow wire is constant hot from the battery. Now, if this is a new installation, go on ahead and wire up everything as if this were, you know, a normal installation, you know, like like the green to green, white to white, black to black, etc. Leave off the yellow wire and the red wire. These will be important later on. Now, unfortunately, you know, this was the old installation, but just so you know, there will be a new radio in here momentarily. Okay, so we're back in the car. Harnesses all ready to go after several hours of new line running, etc. Now, just so you know, I you really should solder and heat shrink wrap your connections. For the most part, I did. For a couple ones, I forgot the heat shrink wrap. But in this regard, the red wire, not, even look, not looking back at, at it, I guess you could say that it was kind of intentional. Like I said once before, this is your control wire for the ignition switch which makes you trigger an accessory and run, which is needed for your relay. So technically, I could pull the duct tape off, run another wire to that splice, solder the new wire in, solder a new relay in, we're good to go if I really wanted to do that. On the other hand, there are two other ways you could tap in a relay. The first <coughs> is in your ignition switch here. There's a brown wire there. Cut it where you can be, feel comfortable with soldering and splicing in a jumper wire in between. Then solder in a number 16 wire and your radio housing here. So that way you can run power around your relay coil and trigger it. The second thing you can do on a 1995 through 1999 Saturn S series is you could tap into the F12 wire. Just so you know, it is seven spaces above the dreaded F5. And the F5 on this Saturn S series for Gen 2. There are three spaces for the underhood junction block for wiring. There's three clusters. The cluster you want is the cluster that would normally be closest to the heater core. That's where your F5 is. So look seven spaces above the F5. You'll find the F12. As a quick QA test, you could put a voltmeter on there. Put power on put the power lead for the voltmeter on the F12 connection, put ground to a good ground, have your buddy or yourself turn the ignition key. You should get 12 volts and accessory and run. Nothing with the key out or with the key off. Now, just as a mechanics tip, I did run some new power leads into the car.
Just so you know, they are red because I like to use red with constant power. What you normally would do is probably like use another color, but because we're going to solder this wire to the yellow wire on the radio harness, which is for the battery power all the time, what I would do is I would mark one of these wires as a yellow wire by putting yellow electric tape on it, and then put the other wire in as you know nothing else unless you're, unless that's the only two wires you're going to run. And I would personally run them one at a time and mark them one at a time. That way you're not confusing yourself later on as to which wire goes where. So the next thing we're going to do now is we're going to solder this wire into this yellow wire. So go on ahead and solder that now. Okay, so now we got the power adapter to do. Um, just so you know, normally you would want to cut off about say two inches, maybe three of the of the orange wire here because that's your power lead for the power adapter. I kind of cut it short accidentally. So this is going to be kind of a pain to solder in, but just so you know, the new power lead goes to the orange wire. Again, cut off about two to three inches of it. You should be able to reuse this ground wire safely. Um, when you're done with that, go ahead and uh, tuck back in the orange wire. In addition, you should also be able to pull out the lighter fuse. It is in the underhood junction block, 20 amp mini fuse. You're not going to need it anymore. So go on ahead and transfer this orange wire here to your new power lead now. Okay, so we're outside of the car now. Just so you know, I got this fuse block here off of Amazon.com. Want to know if I can remember, you know, the part number, make, and all that. I will put a link to it in the video description. As you can see, one thing I don't like already about this block, there isn't an inline fuse to go with it. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take, the, take this inline fuse right here. We're going to cut off the back of it a reasonable length. Tap into this. And then we can start tapping into these for our powers. Just so you know, on a GM vehicle, the only way you could you could safely tap into power is in this fuse block. There is a main positive connection where you can tap into. There it is. That's the only way you can tap in. You could. I've seen people tap into this battery, but the problem is, is that they made this rubber seal around the battery. They did it for a reason. So we're gonna. So what you want to do to tap power in? Disconnect the negative battery terminal. Then dis. Then undo this main positive bolt at the fuse block, and then start cutting everything in. Cut and solder. Make sure you do put a new ring terminal there so you can tap into the power safely and effectively. One last thing real quick before I close this video out is that regarding the relay, you do want to take your ignition power either from the F12, brown wire, the brown wire from the F12, brown wire from the ignition switch, or the red wire from your aftermarket radio and tap into your coil power, then put the other one in the ground you can put it power on 85 or 86, put power on 85, ground down 86, or put power on 86, ground down 85, does not matter. It's just a coil. <coughs> Next thing you do is you run a new power lead, pretty much the same way as I showed you earlier. Put the lead into on the, the wire for pin 30, and then from the wire from pin 87 for your switched contact, you then want to run a fuse block as seen here and then run your fuse block to the rest of your and then run each fuse to the rest of your loads as you can see here and of course try to find the neat a somewhat neatish way to mount your relay and in this regard now that I can now that I got some zip ties I could probably put a zip tie through here through this hole mount it bingo and 
I want to make one quick final less final note here before I do close this video off is that in this regard with the F5 connection I'm talking to that, this the, this big guy right here my new radio sweet I was playing a uh, Magic that saw Magic Man by heart. There's a specific part of that I like to turn the ghetto blasters on, so to speak. I turned it on, it all kept ghetto blasting, then it all cut out. Just so you know, I had a one amp fuse from where my where my cost of power lead was at. Fuse blue. To think that every time I was turning on ghetto blasters for any reason, other than for heart, I was setting sending one amp of current extra current through that f5 you do not want to do that you want to try to keep that as open as possible i didn't forgot to mention this earlier but if you do attempt the relay project only attempt it with an aftermarket radio do not attempt it with a stock radio so if you're going to go back to stock i would personally suggest uh, having uh. the red wire of your radio harness and not the brown wires as, as i said earlier and that's it. That's my video on how to preemptively kick some F5 problems in the rear end. As well as run a couple new power leads in your Saturn S series. And remember, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, praise, etc. about this video, hit me up in the comment section. If you have any questions about the Saturn product line as a whole, which covers the Saturn S series... Saturn L series, Saturn View, Saturn Aura, Saturn Sky, Saturn Outlook, Saturn Relay, and last but not least, the Saturn Astera. Then hit up the Saturn Fans forums, make a nick there, post your questions, and the fine folks at that at that awesome meet at that awesome medium will be awesome to take care of your questions in a timely manner. If you want to see more videos from me, be it whatever I feel like posting. Then hit the subscribe button at the top of this video. It's not hard. You will automatically be subscribed to any video that I post. And you can see my old videos as you wish. In addition, feel free to give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Or a thumbs down if you don't like it. It's been a venture link. I'm going to close this video out, as always, by quoting Eric the Car Guy. Be safe, have fun, and as always, stay dirty. See you all next time.